What I'd really like to focus on, and by the end of this testimony, I'd like two things that I hope that it captures, and I, and I hope the messages are loud and clear, that, that my story is an example of God's redemption, and that second chances really do exist. That's one of the, one of the, one of the messages. And the second message that I really want to hit upon today is that you can overcome any adversity with Christ in your life. And, I, and I'm going to talk about quite a few adversities that was in our lives, which included three years undercover for the FBI and, and also nine years of federal prison. So we did, have, we, we did have the deck stacked against us, but because of Christ in our lives, we were able to get better and not bitter. So I think at the end of the, this testimony, you will see that in terms of my marriage, how our three children are doing, and how our family survived this, survived this ordeal. I had to ask myself during that time, how do I get to the point to my, in my life that I made so many mistakes that I had to become an FBI informant? Because usually when one becomes an FBI informant, it's usually because they've done something wrong that they have to work with the FBI in order to resolve that issue. So I had to ask myself during that time and also during my time in prison, how did I get to the point in my life where I made so many mistakes where I became an FBI informant? And the company that I was going up against was no average company. They're known as ADM, Archer Daniels Midland. Uh, a large company. They were number 56 on the Fortune 500 during that time, the 56th largest company in America. They're even larger than that today. And my compensation at that time with stock options and, and bonuses and base salary was in the, was in the seven figures. I had a million dollar home with eight bedrooms, 13,000 square feet, an eight car garage. And in that eight car garage, I had a Ferrari, two BMWs, two Mercedeses, and three other nice cars. And I had inside riding arena for our kids to ride for horses and, and so on. I mean, it was, it was all about materialism for me. When, when I got to the point where I made millions of dollars at age 32, I felt like I was a rock star. I really did. And, and I had that, uh, uh, I don't could maybe call it a Britney Spears or a Charlie Sheen, uh, Charlie Sheen moment. Or, and I, I just my focus was all in the wrong place. And it was all about materialism. It was all about greed. And fortunately for me, I was blessed with a wife that had her focus in the right place. It took me going to prison to learn the difference between going to church and really being a believer and relying on Christ for guidance. It took me to age 41 to, to, to prison to learn that, even though I went to church my entire life. But when I look back at Scripture now, what is it? What does it profit a man when he, when he sells out his soul? And I was forfeiting my soul and selling my soul for materialism. But again, my wife heart was here. She was into scripture. And I'm going to give you some examples in a minute why this whole case happened because of my wife. Because where your treasure is, is Matthew 6 verse 21, where your treasure is, your heart will be. Well, my treasure was in the wrong place. My treasure was in a Ferrari, two Mercedes's, in those eight car garage. We had seven corporate jets. I could fly anywhere I wanted to in the world. I flew to Hong Kong for lunch and back. So with seven corporate jets, we could fly anywhere we wanted to, anytime we wanted to. And that's the life I was leading. And at age 32, I, I got overconsumed by that. But I tell you, I had, a, I had a void in my heart the size of Grand Canyon. Because God knew where my heart was. And my heart wasn't in the, in the right place. Would you have taken the path that I was taking to protect my job at all costs? Continue to make millions of dollars between my stock and base salary and, and bonuses and so on? Or would you have taken the path and continue to rise up the corporate ladder? Or would you have taken the path that my wife took, where she put her foot down and did the right thing morally and ethically, and said, let's blow the lid off this whole thing and really bring some reality to what we were doing, that we were really just liars and thieves, even though we were acting like in suits as top executives of one of the biggest companies in the world. And uh, she, took the right, she took the right path. And I, and I do want to emphasize that I did tell my wife on that day, on November 5th, 1992, when she said she was telling the FBI if I would not, I did tell her that day that if we tell the FBI I could go to jail, we could, we'll lose this house, this 13,000 square foot house with this eight car garage, we'll lose all these things, our kids would no longer be in private schools. And she, she came back with just as quick, it didn't take her even two seconds to think about it. She said she would rather be homeless than be part of a household where illegal funds were coming into our household. So it didn't matter for her. She had God on her side. So she didn't, ma she didn't care if she lost all the materialistic things that we've gathered and collected during that, during that period of time. So our backgrounds are very similar. Grew up in a small Midwestern town, uh, both Christian families, both went to church our whole life, but there was a huge difference. She was a believer and I was just going through the motions. 
And that's a huge difference. She already had Christ in her heart. She had the Holy Spirit in her heart and she was relying on Christ for guidance. And I was just going to church with my parents because I had to. And there was a difference. And education-wise, God gifted me academically to do some, some, some things educationally that uh, a lot of people in our small town were not able to do. I went to Ohio State University for my bachelor's and master's. It was about an hour and a half out of Cincinnati. It's in Columbus, Ohio. And I got my bachelor's and master's there. Uh, they have a program for gifted students. Out of about 50,000 students, they had 16 in a gifted program on a full scholarship where they get your bachelor's and master's together in four years instead of the normal six years. I was one of those 16 gifted students on a full scholarship at Ohio State in that, in that program. And I got my bachelor's and master's in four years. And then I got a full scholarship at an Ivy League university where I got my PhD in biochemistry, specializing in nutritional biochemistry, and graduated uh, at age 25. At that time, the youngest PhD in biochemistry to graduate from, uh, from Cornell University. And after that, even when I started my career working for a Fortune 500 company, my first job at Ralston Prina, I continued my education at nights, weekends, even with this education that I already had there with a Cornell PhD, I continued it and ended up getting a law degree, ended up getting an LLM, the Master's of Law, ended up getting a PhD in psychology, I ended up getting a PhD in economics, I ended up getting an MBA, I ended up getting nine degrees, six of them doctorate from all the way from the time I graduated from Cornell all the way to about age 40. So I continued my education even after that. But there was one problem with all that education. It was all self-centered. I was focused on myself. How quick can I get up the corporate ladder? How much money can I make? And it was nothing about serving others. And it was definitely my downfall because I focused all the education that God gifted me with to, to, to excel academically and put all that back into myself. And it was just a train wreck ready to happen, and it did happen. When I was working for the FBI, knowing the kind of income that I made and the, what, my, what my stock officers were going to be worth, I did set two at nine and a half million dollars aside. I thought it would take about three years to get back on my feet after I'd be fired for being a whistleblower, after my position would be terminated. So I saw that nine and a half million dollars, since I was going to lose all my stock options, all my stock, I wouldn't be able to exercise those because the company would withhold those. I kind of saw that as, 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 our, as our safety net, as kind of our severance to get back on our feet. And I didn't tell my wife about that part because I knew she would turn me in. But what happened was ADM did expose it and they exposed it immediately about the nine and a half million dollar fraud. But even with that, the FBI still supported me. Because I wore a wire for three years, the longest of duration of anybody in history. They knew I was under a lot of stress. They knew I was making some poor judgment decisions because of the stress I was under. So they still supported me. And they actually went with the prosecutors with a really good attorney who's now a judge, a judge in Chicago named James Epstein. And they met with the prosecutors and they talked about how I was the highest level executive ever to turn whistleblower in U.S. history. Still holds true today, 20 years later that moniker. And then they also talked about how I never saw a psychologist or psychiatrist for three years. When an FBI agent goes undercover, they see a psychologist or psychiatrist every three months. They get psychiatric help to, to deal with a double life. They also don't go undercover longer than a year because they crack under pressure. I went for three years and I was untrained and I didn't see any psychologist, psychiatrist. So they emphasized that with the prosecutors for a plea deal. Matter of fact, informants are not allowed to go undercover longer than a year now because of this case because they know that there's a chance they would crack under pressure during that point. They also talked about that most of the nine and a half million dollars was taken during a time when my mental stability was at its worst. The last six months, nine months that I was working undercover. So with that, the prosecutor said, yeah, we do understand. They were very, uh, they, they really wanted to work with us. And the prosecutors were agreeing to a three-year plea deal and allow the FBI agents to go present the same thing to my judge at a sentencing hearing that would have been a couple months later. And my lawyer felt strongly that the end result would be about a six-month prison sentence, six months. Well, I fired my lawyer the following day. I distanced myself from the government. I was not even willing to accept, again, the mindset that I was in. Again, not relying for Christ for guidance. I'm relying only on Mark Whitaker for guidance. And, and it was a train wreck that the worst train wreck was yet to happen. And I fought that case for almost two more years. And I got nine years when I could have had six month, six month prison sentence. Again, my own worst, my own worst enemy. Completely my own worst enemy. When they were trying to help me, I cut their legs out from under them. And with that, I quickly went for where we had seven corporate jets, could fly anywhere in the world, to handcuffs. From age 41 to age 49, in my case, I was in prison. To put it in a family perspective, our youngest son was six years old 
when I went to prison. Six years old. No, he was six years old in first grade when I went undercover. And I never saw him because I was working with the FBI at night. I was wearing the wire at ADM all day long. So I actually saw him in prison a lot more than I ever did when I worked at ADM. So he was six when I went undercover. He was 12 years old and in seventh grade when I went to prison. He was 21 years old and a junior in college when I walked out of those prison gates. But that's what, that's what nine years, that's what nine years of prison. Excuse me one minute. But a person from the CBMC, Christian Businessmen Connection, which is what this luncheon's about, before I went to prison, read in the newspaper that I was going to likely go to prison, he came to my house and he sat with me hour after hour, three days a week for four months before I entered prison and went through the Bible study with me for those four months. And as I entered prison, I continued reading that Bible. He planted a seed. And in prison, three months into it, in June of 1998, for the first time in my life, is when I became, when I brought the Holy Spirit into my heart, and it's the first time I became a believer, and really learned the difference between going to church every Sunday and really being a believer. And it was age 41 in June of 1998. And it's all because of the seed that was planted by a gentleman named Ian Howes in Chapel Hill that started visiting me from the CBMC for four months. And I thought, boy, I just wish I would have met him 20 years earlier. <laughs> My career, remember I talked about even with an Ivy League PhD, would I be employable? Nine years of prison, convicted felon. Boy, it didn't look good. I got hired the day after I got out of prison, back in the same field that I studied in, PhD in biochemistry. As Paul Willis mentioned, the CEO of our company, there's fewer than 100 around the world. Paul was also very involved with prison, uh, prison uh, prison ministry, and he started visiting me in prison in 2001, five years before I got out. And he started visiting me and offered me a job the day after I got out. I've been there five years this month. And I believe my story and my testimony, I believe, is a perfect example of Romans 8, 28. That he took something that, that you would look like it was a mess, and to me it was a mess when I was in the middle of the storm, but it was really, there was all planned. And it's a plan to come out and help others that are going through adversities because we're all going to go through adversities. I realize everybody in this room, nobody's going to be going to prison or nobody's going to be working as an undercover FBI agent and so on and things of that sort. But we're all going to have adversities in our life with medical sicknesses, the economic climate, with finances and so on. And with God in our life and Christ in, and Christ in our hearts, we can overcome any adversity. And I believe the story that my wife and I have, I believe is proof of that because we've had miracles in our life as a result of it. See, I was all about high station. I was all about title. Could I be the next president of the 56th largest company in America? And it took me to going through what I went through to realize that don't matter. That doesn't mean anything at all to have those titles and cards. And there's a lot of value of knowing God. And I'm living proof I can tell from age 41 and before and age 41 and after. God is awesome. So I urge all of you, if you haven't, to reach out to God because He can do amazing things in and through your lives. And I, I really urge you to do that. And I appreciate your opportunity today. I, it's great to be here. It's a blessing to be here. And I love being in Fresno. And, and just thanks a lot for coming and spending your, spending your afternoon here, here today. I appreciate it. Thank you.